Aloha my kako and welcome back to my channel everyone. If you are new to my channel, mahalo for stopping by. I hope you all are enjoying this beautiful view of the Ko'olau mountain range. So I was recently invited to another orchid club meeting, this time for the Honolulu Orchid Society. And their guest speaker for the evening was Ben Oliveros. Ben is the owner of Orchid Eros, located in Mountain View on the Big Island of Hawaii. Some of you in Florida may recognize him because he has been a vendor at some of your orchid shows. The topic for the evening was winning awards and how to grow cattleyas to their full potential. I hope you all enjoy. Hello everybody. We're so happy to have all of you here in person. It's uh, a privilege for me to introduce two bands. There's a Ben Kodama Jr. hiding way in the back, but he's primarily responsible to have tonight's speaker here, which is Ben Oliveris. Uh, where is Ben? He's hiding again. We want to thank you, Ben, for picking him up at the airport and hosting him, but he'll be spending the night at Ala Moana Hotel. I hope you have a nice evening. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce Ben Oliveris, or Benjamin Oliveris, and this good-looking guy, stand up. Too bad, ladies, he's married. <laughs> he grew up in Atlanta and has been growing orchids for 30 years. In Atlanta, he, uh, for 12 years, he was a commercial orchid grower, and uh, for the last 18 years, he's been growing orchids on the Big Island, he owns, he's the owner of Orchid Eros, E-R-O-S, a nursery dedicated to advancing species and hybrids of the Cadillac Alliance. In, uh, as an American Orchid Society judge, he has learned the importance of quality. As a potted plant grower, he knows the need for flowering for rest. So that doesn't mean many, many flowers a day. Uh, he goal, his goal is to bring you superior flowers on plants that bloom early and bloom often. His latest honor is that he just won four of the 2022 American Orchid Society's annual awards. And so here is our illustrious Ben Oliveris to speak to us tonight. On my website. That's a good introduction. Um, apparently, my remote to advance is not going to work after changing batteries several times, so um, I'm going to try to sit somewhere with my computer a little out of the way, uh, as far as my code will reach, maybe. I don't want to block the screen for too many people, but maybe come that way and I'll come this way. Uh, sorry about that. Always some kind of technical difficulty. Yeah, I don't have a laser pointer. The flicker is broken. So, I'll do this manually. Um, so I've won a lot of awards in the past, you know, I guess 18 years. Um, I started as a judge in Atlanta. I did a couple of years as a student judge there before I moved to the Big Island. Uh, so I started getting awards in Atlanta when I was hanging around the judges there. And since then, I've gotten probably 250 or more awards on the Big Island. Um, and have since become the Hawaii Regional Chair of the Judging Center. So a lot of this talk is about American Orchid Society judging and trying to recruit people into it. So uh, bear with me on that. If you're not interested in becoming an AOS judge, uh, I'm going to give a recruitment talk anyway. Um, towards the end of this, um, I'll give you a, some more cultural information on specific plants. Uh, and they'll kind of go hand in hand with some beautiful photographs. Brad or whoever is watching the clock, um, give me a hook whenever you need to, because uh, I, I try to go for 45 minutes, but I get pretty enthusiastic about this. So, uh, whenever you guys are starving to death and need to get me off the stage, feel free to 
to post me and I can rapidly go through the end of the talk. So, the winning formula. Join the AOS judging program. Uh, that's the easiest way to get awards, I find. Um, the reason for this is because as a judge, uh, you learn how to research the competition. Um, as a more involved orchid enthusiast, you'll learn what it is to buy better plants. One of the things that I think gets me a lot of awards is, and probably guys like Mel and, and others in Honolulu, you grow things as to the biggest and the best that they can be grown. Uh, there's a wow factor in that. And it helps to groom your plants if you're taking them in for judging. Um, you want them to be camera ready. And an important part of this whole thing is be a good sport. Uh, we, we often take our plants very seriously. They're our children, and we get our feelings hurt when the judges poo-poo them. Um, but it, it is still something we do for fun, we do for beauty. So uh, try and be a good sport. And when I get this talk to the mainland, I tell them the best way to get awards. Move to Hawaii. <laughs> so why do you even play the game? Why do we want to be judges? Um, kind of like being in an orchid society, it brings us pleasure in sharing the things that we find our passions in. So sharing something beautiful. The reason I like getting awards, um, and the AOS system is set up for providing a benchmark for the best of the best. So it's a standard of quality. You get professional photographs taken for the $35 or $40 you spend on your awards. So that's cheaper than going to Sears. Pedigreed plants are more coveted and of higher value. It's kind of like dogs or cats in that regard. Uh, we, we, we definitely get more from having a, an award on, on our plants. And the AOS is really making most of its money off of awards these days. Uh, the, the cost of a magazine subscription kind of pays for itself. The cost of the awards goes in their bank. So, the pros of being an orchid judge is you are forced to learn quickly. Ask Eddie. Uh, you kind of are pressured into learning things on a monthly basis, doing homework, uh, researching more. You're surrounded by a group of incredibly knowledgeable people like Roy Tokunaga and many faces I see in the audience here today. You get an understanding of the process. Uh, it's kind of hard a lot of times to understand why judges have passed your plant when you really don't understand the rules of the game. And one of the best benefits for me is as a judge you get VIP access to shows. So when I go to somewhere like the Tokyo Dome show, rather than getting in with 100,000 people on the first day, I get in two days before with 300 people. So you get to take photographs, you get to see the show, you get to buy plants before anybody else is in there. So that's one of the biggest perks. So in getting to know the competition, um, you can basically do independent research on your own to know if your plant is even worthy of, of entering the game. Um, and that's basically what judges are going to be doing. We're comparing your plants against what's the previous standard of, of awardable plants. And there are a couple of databases that have all the information you need to do the, the research at home. There's Orchid Wiz, which is my favorite. Uh, it's going to cost you 230 bucks for your first subscription, unfortunately. And then $90 a year after that if it goes forward after that. They're uh, talking about closing that database. Then Orchids Pro is something you get free online if you're an AOS member. So that one is advancing day by day and pretty soon I think it'll be up to the quality of Orchid Wiz. And this is just a, a little tidbit of information that a lot of people never make use of when they enter plants into judging. You're filling out an entry form, which I should have given you a picture of, but there's a section on there that says comments. And you are welcome to make comments of your own if there's something you want the judges to be aware of, like why you're presenting this plant to judging. Um, I almost never see people use this section of the entry form, but it helps 
if you see something you think is special, to draw their attention to it because maybe they don't catch that in, in their scrutiny of the plant. So I've started using this more and I find it helps and judges not missing something. So in scouting quality, uh, when you are looking for plants that are going to be award quality, uh, help having awarded parents is a great place to start. And understanding that not all seedlings are the same is also something worth noting. If you're buying seedling grown plants like I offer, every plant out of that seed pod is going to be different from each other. So just buying a single plant may not tell you the quality of the overall composition of, of that group of plants. So I encourage people to buy multiple plants so they see a broader spectrum of that bell curve and maybe one out of those five might be the one that's the, the truly exceptional plant. And this I put in for a cus customer in Florida that always would walk by my sales booth and say, oh, I already have that. That's a Cattleya Luna Maniana. And I finally told the guy, well, you don't have this Cattleya Luna Maniana. Every batch of seedlings is going to be different. So you may have a particular species or a particular hybrid, but if it's a different seedling population, you don't have it. Because it could be something different and truly exceptional. And Lastly, the exceptional flowers are going to come from exceptional parents most of the time. So try to buy things with pedigree. So here's an example of something that's slightly better than average in the Cattleya Lutomaniana on the left. And then in the right is really what you want. Something that's really full and round and much better than, than average. And another example of kind of normal versus a superstar. The Cattleya Persevilliana on the left was basically the only Persevilliana cerulea known to man at the time through the works of Armando Montalini, a great Venezuelan, and myself. In three generations, we went from flower on the left to the flower on the right. And we're continuing to line, line breed them to get them even better than that. All from just a single source of genetics. So this shows you where Cattleya clandii were 20 years ago, and they were awardable like that then. Now there's a new standard. Uh, the one on the right is basically what you're going to want to get a, a clandii awarded today. Um, and this is a good example of diploid versus tetraploid. Uh, does anybody here not know what 2N versus 4N is? Feel free to raise your hand and I'll explain if you don't. But Roy should have talked to this by now. And this is something to show you that you can either buy a bunch of seedlings or you can just go out there and spend a lot of money and buy something superior right off the bat. So all depends on your wallet and your patience. I bought probably a dozen Cattleya Prey Stands con colors when they first came out. And I got one winner out of it. It got an AM. Uh, about four years ago, I went to Brazil and I found a plant that probably cost me five times what those initial 12 plants did, but it was worth an FCC. So you can spend the money and just buy something of work quality much easier than growing out a large population. So if you're selecting seedlings, and if you're looking at a, a group of plants on my bench and you have a dozen things to choose from, um, there are going to be differences that you can see in that group of plants. So this is something Roy's probably talked to you about before, but you can look at just the morphology of the plant without seeing the flower. And you can come up with things that can guide you to a better plant. So I start picking out plants when they're very young based on how thick the leaves are, how wide the leaves are, if they're rounded on their tips, if the roots are fatter rather than being skinnier than the rest of the group, that may be a tetraploid. Um, if the root tips have no pigment to them, that may be an alba. So there are things just in the plant itself that can lead you to exceptional flowers. And so I literally start picking out plants as I'm taking them out of the flask and I keep selecting the anomalies along the way. Things that grow better, things that have those foliage characteristics. 
And then it's also important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater the first time they flower, because that first bloom is not necessarily going to be representative of what the next bloom is going to be. They're not really up to, to size and, and the heft in the plant to give you a full flower of the quality that will be as a mature flower. And I'll show you some examples of that. So here's the case of looking for anomalies in plants. Um, I had a whole batch of volcano queen clones, uh, like a thousand of these things. And I was seeing out of these miracle populations, there were a few plants that looked different than the rest. They should have all been the same things as clones. So I set those aside. And five years later, when I started blooming them, I had tetraploid mutations coming out of that batch of clones. So I got an FCC out of a mutation from a clonal population. And you can see just by looking at the pictures, which one would you rather own? So it's worth, it's worth having a selection like that to find the ones that are different. So this may be harder to read from the back of the room, but I'll try to surmise it for you a little bit. So I think it's very important to grow your plants up to a, a good hefty plant, not exhibiting them on the first flowering, which is very difficult to do sometimes but grow them up to their full potential. Um, the first blooms are underperforming, and as the plants mature, the flowers get bigger, fuller. Um, and I'll show, again, I'll show you some flowering examples of that. And you'll get more points on a larger plant with more flowers. So, there are a lot of plants out there that you really don't want to exhibit first, second, third, fourth time they flower. A lot of your bifoliate cats you need to get them three feet tall before they really hit their stride. Uh, so there are some things I've waited a decade before I've exhibited them just so they're really at their maximum potential. And I'll show you some photos of those in a bit. I also find with cats, it's, they bloom their best on that first growth that walks out of the pot. And it has a lot of roots that are in the air and it's really at its, its maximum. Because when you repot it after that, you've just set it back a year or two again, and then it's got to grow back up to that potential. So I always try to let them take one growth out of the pot before I repot them, and that's usually when I get my feet flowering. I treat cattleyas differently um, based on the morphology of the plants and the species and the groups that they fall in. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail on that. And in case y'all haven't figured this out yet, I'm a Catlea guy. So you're not going to hear about much other than Catleas. This talk was written for the Catlea Symposium in Florida, so that's kind of what is tailored towards. I'll throw in a few eyeballs, but mostly you're going to be hearing about cats today. Um, I also find it's important to watch flowers a few times, uh, not just in the size of the, the plant and its maturity, but flowers change from season to season. And a good example is Saphronitis coccinea. In the winter, there are these big, beautiful, round, full red flowers. If you bloom it in the summer, you want to step on the thing. And there are a lot of plants that just based on the temperatures, the light, um, the humidity, the flowers are going to change even on the same plant. Um, so things that are in the coccinea family, You'll want to take them to judging in the winter when they're at their full potential. And then timing is everything. Um, you've got a very short window with Catleas to get them to a judging table. Sometimes it's just a few days of when they're fully opened and presentable and they don't have the tritus spots or thrips gnawing on them. Uh, it can take years to get something in in that window of opportunity. So, you know, you guys here I think have one judging once a month, right? So, it, okay, so if you get two judging, that opens the door for a few more possibilities, but um, I've, I've waited a decade for a plant to be timed right for a judging, um, and not just because of, you know, the plant not being judgeable, but just the flowers weren't presentable when the judging was taking place, so patience is the key there. So here, here's a slide showing when I exhibited a plant when it really wasn't, wasn't a mature plant yet versus a few years later when the plant had a lot of root mass and a lot of suitable growth. So this is the same 
philosopher, the same plant. Flowers on the left are kind of droopy. There are not as many of them. Exact same plant. But once it had a great root system and a, a lot of super bulbs and good foliage, the flowers themselves improved. It went from having like five flowers to 11 flowers on an inflorescence. So it went from being an HCC quality plant to an AM. Another example of taking something in at the wrong time and only had one flower open. If those other three buds had been open, maybe it would have gotten, would have gotten the HCC. But I took it back in when it was at the right time and peak performance. Six flowers all open simultaneously, and then it went up to a high AM. So this Cattleya Triani, first time I exhibited it, um, got an HCC. I thought it was worth more than that, so I took it back in again. They upgraded it to an AM. That same year, it won the Miyamoto Award for the best Cattleya for 2018 against all the other Cattleyas in the United States. So, Oh, that was worth taking back in too. And this just kind of shows what a specific plant can do for you award wise. The photo on the right, uh, which is the AM photograph, if those were the two flowers presented for a, an award quality, I don't think any judges would have given it an AM. But because it had a massive plant with 30 something flowers on it, uh, they gave it an AM just because of the wow factor. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that as a freebie, but uh, it really wasn't worth it. I was looking for the CCE, or C Certificate of Cultural Excellence, because that's a species you don't see growing that big that often. Hey, probably. And uh, another example of the wow factor, when you bring something in that's a specimen, you're much more likely to get a, an AM or something out of it than if you're just presenting something with one or two flowers on it. This is a Maxima with more flowers than anybody's ever seen. Uh, this was 16 flowers on a stem. And that's what happens when you grow a plant to, to its maximum. And this was just showing uh, kind of what I was talking about with seasonality changes and in color. This is out of Roy's breeding of trying to get to, to black and plenty eyes. These things in the right climate and conditions, they'll have solid black flowers. Uh, if there's too much warmth or too much sun, it gets these little bars in it. Uh, doesn't make them any less appealing, but they change from blooming to blooming on the same plant. So this is one of the amethystic glosses I was saying you don't want to take in on a young plant. I mean, it's still pretty impressive with eight or nine flowers, but once you grow them up to 10, 12, 15 flowers on the stem, they're, they're much more spectacular. And this is also all out of Roy's breeding, I believe. This is another species that people rarely see grown up to its, its fullest. Uh, Lorenzianums are typically known for maybe 12, 14 inch tall plants with three or four flowers. And I grew this into something about two feet tall with 12 flowers on the stem. And the judges almost didn't believe it was a Lorenzianum because it just had too many blooms. But it is. It was just much happier than Hawaii and then growing much, much anywhere else. And so this is some cases of me being a disgruntled exhibitor as well as a judge. Um, the ACC I got on the Eclandi Eye on the left. Uh, luckily, I got voided uh, because the judging team missed that there was like an eight point spread in the, the points. Um, this, I thought it was an FCC quality flower and I was kind of miffed at the HCC, and luckily, there was a mistake in the judging process, so I got voided. I'll take it back in again on another day. And then the one on the right, when our award registrar saw this award come in. She says, okay, here's the biggest, best FCC, or biggest and best acclaim the eye ever seen. Why did you get an AM? I said, well, because they've seen too many of my acclaim the eyes. Um, but Bill Rogerson is the creator of these, and he's basically got the best in the world, even better than the Brazilians. Um, but 
he and I both have just set the bar too high, so I don't think we'll ever get our SECs out of them. But then sometimes I get SECs that really weren't worth, worth that either. Uh, this was the only Elongata Alba ever seen, so they were pretty stunned by it, and they gave it, instead of like a CHM, an FCC. Uh, it's pretty nice, but it's not that nice. And this was the plant that I was saying took over a decade for me to get into judging. I moved from Atlanta with this plant. Um, I knew it was a award quality when I brought it here. And I lived here about eight years before I ever was able to time it right to get it into judging. Uh, this, this is a plant that's about three feet tall and pin flowers that are almost the size of a standard Catlia bloom. It's my favorite plant in my entire nursery. And so you'll often hear judges say size is only 10 points, um, but it's a very important 10 points because that's the only objective thing that we really have to go on. So we, we put too much credit into measurements sometimes. And here's kind of a case of, of where that came into play. Um, the first time I entered in this Delosa, I got an AM on it. And I think it had three flowers, which is good for a Delosa. Um, a few years later, I had seven flowers on this, which nobody's ever seen more than four before. These flowers were more than a centimeter bigger than they were on the first exhibition, so it got elevated to an FCC because of the floriferousness and the larger size of the flowers. And they are near perfect flowers, so it was worth the FCC. Okay, for those people not into cactus, here's a couple of other things. And this is just things and growing a bigger and better plant. Um, I, I love the angry coins, I rarely exhibit them, but on the day my first son was born, uh, my wife kicked me out of the hospital because I was giving her bad vibes or something. So I went home to the nursery and picked up a couple of plants and went to judge it. And I named the syringes after my son that was born that day, Gabriel Navarro. And I got a CCM and an HCC on the day he was born. Ten years later, they elevated this to a CCE. Um, it's now in spike now with probably three times the amount of uh, inflorescences that this had. So this, this was a plant when first awarded was in a seven inch pot kind of leaning over. That seven inch pot fell over on the bench. It still has not been touched. So it's basically growing on a pot on its side with roots just wrapped around the pot, wrapped around the bench, unpotted since its inception. And it just keeps getting bigger and better. So it's kind of an example of not disturbing roots. If you can keep them thriving with a great root system and not repotting, uh, it's you know a, a great way to go. And I'll give you some tips on how to, to do that coming up. So grooming, I'm not the guy to tell you how to groom plants. I basically just grab them off the bench and take them into judging. Um, but you really do want to take your plants in, camera ready, you know, try to make the foliage look nice, stake them up, uh, make them presentable, clean up the old shoes. Um, if you really want to learn how to do this properly, get a talk from Keith Davis. He's an expert on it and happy to share his information. But, uh, I say, I'm, I'm not the guy. Uh, I like them to groom themselves. I didn't have to stake this or do anything to it. They're perfectly spaced, nice, sturdy spike. That's what I want. My Catholic my colors, on the other hand, if I don't stake them, they have so many big, heavy flowers, the spikes break almost every single time. So I actually took the time to stake this up and was able to get it awarded. This I didn't want a cultural award on, so I didn't clean it up at all. And unfortunately, they still made me pay my 40 bucks for the cultural award, only because it was a big Normaniana. And these things usually are dead Normanianas. Um, but that, that shouldn't have been presented that way if I wanted to get a cultural award. I should have shined the leaves a little bit, and staked it up, and made it look a little nicer. Uh, that was not what I was going for. And so then, there are some plants that there's really just not a lot you can do with them because of the way they bloom. Um, you know, with the ridiculous lalias on Sid and I's thing like that, you really got to start staking them as soon as you're seeing immature influorescences come up if you really 
want them to be well staked and presented. Uh, these I just grabbed off the bench. Um, I'm happier getting AMs and HCCs than paying for people to tell me I know how to grow a good plant. Uh, I don't really want the cultural awards, but sometimes I got them. So briefly on sportsmanlike conduct, um, hopefully all you guys are in sports out there. But just remember that judges are people too. Sometimes we've had a bad day, sometimes we missed our snack and our blood sugar is low. And I find from one judging to the next, things can change. So a lot of times I'll have a plant get screened that I knew was worth an AM, but it was just not the right day for it. Um, could have been, you know, somebody on the team was having a bad day and downplaying the plant, or you know, the, the light was bad, or any number of reasons. Um, so if they tell you to bring it back in again, yeah. take them seriously and bring it back in again because um, from one judging to the next, it could be different. And it is kind of daunting for us as judges because we're usually a small group of people, five, six guys on a team, and we're making national standards for the American Orchid Society. So we're often really conservative about these decisions we make. Um, so a lot of times plants come in that you you absolutely are in love with, you know it's beautiful, and we may not award it just because uh, we don't want to set the bar somewhere that we're not comfortable with for a national standard. Now, one thing that I have a problem with as a judge, and I may try to change this someday when uh, I have a little more clout, somebody might listen to me. There's no appeals process for an exhibitor. The handbook is tailored just to judges and the judges' rules and guidelines. And so if you're a disgruntled exhibitor, there's basically nothing you can do. And I've been a disgruntled exhibitor before, and I would like to be able to say, hey, I don't want this HCC. This plant was worthy of a better award than that. I don't want to pay the 30 bucks for it. But if I did that, I'd never be able to get an award again. So hopefully someday we'll have some process for, for dealing with issues on the exhibitor end, but we aren't there yet. Kate, maybe you can help me with this someday. And so this was kind of written for a particular uh, exhibitor we have in Hilo. But try to keep your comments to yourself until the end of judging. Um, sometimes if the judges are going in a direction that you're not necessarily uh, seeing eye to eye with, don't argue with them then. Wait until they're done and then you can make your comments to them. One, if you're criticizing them while they're in the process, it's probably not opening their eyes, but it's closing their ears, and it's not going to help your case. Um, and hot-headed judges, or hot-headed exhibitors, are not likely to be treated quite as fairly. We're supposed to be doing this objectively, but we're still people. So if you're yelling at the judges, how do you think they're going to treat your plan? Okay, now to the good stuff, what you really want. And bear in mind, cultural tips for me and Mountain View, Big Island, wet, 1,600 foot elevation, you know, 200 and something inches of rain a year, may not quite be the same as growing in Waikiki. Um, so if you've got a system that works for you, do what works for you, and maybe just take some hints from what I'm going to tell you. But if you live somewhere with perfect intermediate conditions up in the mountains, um, do what I do. So I vary potting methods based on the roots of the plants. Um, I do a lot of what I call pot mounting, uh, which I'll explain briefly because it kind of doesn't make much sense. But rather than mounting a plant on a piece of hapu or a piece of bark, if I ever want to move that plant, divide that plant, um, it's difficult to do when it's mounted on something solid. So I mount them in a pot. So I'll fill the pot up halfway, three quarters of the way with peanuts, put the plant in and just put one layer of bark across the top just to hold the peanuts into place. And so it's basically now mounted in a plastic pot. And so the roots can go into the pot, they can wrap around the outside of the pot, they're still not in any kind of media that's gonna hold a lot of water. Um, but then when I do wanna repot this or make a division of it, it's very easy to do so because I'm not having to saw through a piece of wood. 
Um, so I really like pot mounting plants. I do a lot of this in net pots. Um, it gives the air, a lot more aeration to the roots. Um, I only grow in sphagnum and clay for very specific things that won't grow any other way. And that's Rupiculus lalias and Saphronitis coccinea. Um, they really want something that's going to have some moisture to it, but um, to, to dry pretty quickly and stay fairly uh, cool. So the sphagnum and clay works well for that. Otherwise, uh, sphagnum really doesn't work well for me. And what I call pot within a pot is I really hate disturbing roots. Yeah, that's the quickest way to, to set your orchids back. So many times, if I've got a, an orchid, and maybe there's some examples up here, you know, if the orchid's you know, getting roots completely wrapped around the container that it's in and growing on the container, rather than ripping it out of that pot, damaging most of the roots that are wrapped around the pot, I'll just simply slip a four inch into a six inch Put some peanuts and some mark around it and call it a day. Much quicker process. You're not setting the plant back. If you do start getting any like rot in the media or something in the older bark that's in that four inch yeah. pot, at least it's still contained in there. And so the pathogens or whatever the problem is not going to go into the area around it that it's kind of been repotted into. So it's a lazy way to pot and it's effective for keeping a great root system. So I find that a lot of the plants that end up getting awards for me are things that I really just have not disturbed the roots in a long time like that. So it's really important to observe winter rests of species that you know need a winter rest. And you can do research online through your databases, um, but things like the bifoliate cattleyas that just shut down in the winter, no more new growths, no more new roots. If you water them too much, they're going to rot the roots and the plants are going to go bye-bye. Um, Cattleya nobiliores, wacarianas, dalianas, elderados, violaceas. I throw them all into this group if I keep them really dry in the wintertime. I think the quickest way to kill a plant is overwatering it. Uh, if you're overwatering it when it's cold, that's a recipe for bacteria. So I'll let them excessively shrivel in the wintertime. My Cattleya dalianas, which are something most people always kill. Uh, I have killed one plant in the past couple of years out of about 500 dalianas that I own. Uh, usually it's about 50% people kill on these. So the way I've learned to grow them is they get shut off at Thanksgiving and not watered again until Valentine's Day. So they've got three months of desiccation. And at the end of that three months, they are yellow, they are shriveled up, they look like hell, but they're not dead. If I would have watered them during the winter, they would have guaranteed gotten some sort of rot running through the rhizome or starting at the leaf tip, and they would have been dead. Violaceas do the same way for me. If I water them in the winter, they die. So I just shut them off, they shrivel up, but as soon as I start watering them again, when they're actively growing in the spring, they pluck back up, they bloom beautifully, and they stay alive. So if you have trouble with any particular plant that you really love and you routinely kill, don't give up on it, just try something different. And normally it's just observing something that they need, like resting during the winter. And something else that I've kind of discovered through trial and error and advice from guys like Alan Cox at Gold Country Orchids, is not all Cattleyas need Cattleya light. There are some that actually thrive better and more light and less light. Um, I'll give you a small list here. Uh, the, what we used to call aliens, the Pumula, Freystans, Allegories, Cattleya Clandiais, even my Schillerianas I grow in more like an obsidian quality light and I get more blooms out of them in less light. And then conversely, things like Wacariana and Anceps, um, Nobilior, in much higher light, like 30% shade, uh, they perform a whole lot better and give you a lot more flowers. So on the cultural tips, the first thing I would say is read the Bill Ryerson article. Um, it's been published in Orchids a couple of times. It's been published in Orchid Digest. I'm sure you can find it online somewhere. 
But he set up a times table on a calendar of when to repot each different type of cattleya based on when it roots. And that's the most important thing, no matter what your work it is, is when you see those new green root tips coming out, that's when you repot them. So I really watch each different group or variety of plants I have, and they get repotted in about a two week window, depending on when they're rooting. And if I miss that window because I'm holo holo, then I wait until the next year. Um, now with the hybrids, they're a little more forgiving. You can kind of repot them willy nilly, but particularly with species and bifoliates and things that don't put out very many roots a year, you don't want to damage those new roots when they're, when they're coming out. So you catch them just as they emerge, try not to break off those tips, and you know, just catch them in active growth. So if I don't do a lot of repotting in the winter, and then I start watching like a hawk all spring and summer long for when things are actively rooted. Um, fertilizer, you probably have heard enough about this from Roy Tokenaga, but the one thing he probably will not tell you is that urea can be a good thing. Um, most people have really gone to nitrate nitrogen for their, their, um, their nitrogen needs, but the old school uh, 301010 that has a lot of urea in it, uh, the urea kind of gives you super plants that are pumped up on steroids. They're not great for shipping because these things, like steroids, they deflate, and they, they get bacteria and things when you stick them in a box. But if you're a backyard grower just growing for, for pretty flowers, the urea actually stimulates longer inflorescences, bigger and better flowers. So uh, I think it's, it's worth using as, as a supplement sometimes. Really, nitrate nitrogen is the best way to go, but uh, there are benefits to urea as well. And I'm sure you've heard enough from Roy about cow bag, but use a lot of cow bag. And so this is a case of lowering the light level. Um, when I got this Eclandii awarded, uh, I had two flowers each on two of the fluorescences. After moving this plant back into oncidium quality light, which was about half Cattleya light, I'm now getting five flowers on the stem, which is unheard of with the Eclandii eyes. Um, but the proof was in the pudding. And this was a Violacea just to show you that they don't always die in the winter was my scenario for many, many years because I'm in a cooler climate and these things want 65 degrees and up all the time. Great plant for Honolulu, you can water it year round here. For me, I gotta shut them down in the winter and let them desiccate. Yeah. And, and then the rot subsides. And kind of the same thing with Walkerianas. Uh, Cattleya bicolors is a bifoliate. These guys, um, I water sparingly in the winter, but with the bifoliates, I find when, when I lose the roots on these, it's really hard to ever bring the plant back around again. So they're one that I've started uh, really doing um, kind of an empty pot method that I learned from Mike Blitz in Maui. I just stick them in the bottom of a, a big plastic pot and let them just grow on themselves, really no media, no nothing just growing roots in an empty pot. You gotta water them every other day this way um, when they're actively growing, but then there's no media in the pot to rot out the roots. So it's a good trick for things that you may be prone to rotting roots on, is just don't use any mix at all. They water more often. Now the Shillerianas, I've heard basically all pot mounted. And uh, I would say there's nobody other than me and Mike Blitz who grow these things this specific way that can put more than five or six flowers on a Schillerianna. Um, this one I think had 11, it got awarded, and I put as many as 16 on one stem on a Schillerianna, which people in Brazil have never even heard of that. But that's just growing them absolutely to their fullest potential. This was a plant, um, was the most money I've ever spent on a plant in my life. And it was a beautiful tin bulb division and a Brazilian friend brought it from me. One of two plants known to man in Catania Schilleriana Alba. And this tin bulbs within about six months went down to three bulbs. 
brought in from the back. Um, but by carefully cutting through the rhizome until I hit a nice green bulb without black in it anymore, I brought this thing back to life. Um, and it just stays mounted, untouched. Um, and I was able to get an award on it finally uh, after nearly losing my sanity on it. Okay. All right, I went too far off track here. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures now of a number of SCCs. Uh, I think I'm maybe up to about 10 of these now. And, a lot of it's due to the, the pedigree of the plant, but I would say you, the majority of it is due to just growing the plants really impeccably. And most of that's thanks to living in Mountain View, uh, but a lot of it's thanks to having mentors like Roy and Fred Clark and others that know how to grow a good plant and listening to what they have to say. Close it. So, halfway to tie gorillas. Probably had close to 30 flowers on that inflorescence on a plant that was over three feet tall. Uh, this Walkeriana came from Roy, and unfortunately, the Flavia really didn't show up well in the photograph. But a beautifully flared Walkeriana, and it was the biggest one on record to date, which is a I think why it went over the FCC line. Uh, it's not quite round enough to me to be an FCC, but it was the biggest. And it counts for more than 10 points. Uh, Vaceae alba. Um, this is something pretty rare. And this was kind of a new standard set from the old standard back in the 80s. Uh, they've improved a lot since then. Uh, I kept this Vaceae flamea alive after finally learning how to not kill them. And so flame, it's almost back to solid color again. And so this this is what growing in uh, Dalyana to perfection will do for you. Um, this is probably a tetraploid flower for starters. Um, but I've grown this plant since I lived in Atlanta. And maybe 15 years later, I finally exhibited it when, when it was really at its fullest. But the flowers were such heavy substance when Dalyanas are are really typically flimsy, um, and a lot of that was just the culture of the plant. Uh, this is not an FCC, but this was one of the four national awards that I just got for 2021 that they just released in 2022. Uh, the Gerber Award is for the best uh, Brassicola hybrid. Uh, I couldn't find my, my far away shot of this, but this was something that probably had 30 flowers on it. Maybe 10 per flower spike. Uh, this Persevilliana got an FCC and won the best Catlia for 2021. And this was from generations of lion breeding. Um, they may have been one of the, the first FCCs I've gotten on something I bred myself versus something I just bought from somebody else. Uh, that population got two FCCs out of the same seed pod. And this is a hybrid between Harrisoniana and Logan GCI. Uh, better than either parent. The Schofieldiana, kind of surprised that this got over the FCC mark because it's uh, generally not a cat that everybody loves, but uh, it's a beautiful example of what it is. Another Tigrina. Little similar to the one you saw before, but a close-up. These are all tetraploids, which helps helps in getting awards. And then Cygnosis is something a little different. Um, I basically only grow these because they're a relatively newly discovered Peruvian species, and I'm married to a beautiful Peruvian woman, so I have to grow something for her. Um, but this I've done three generations of. Uh, starting with the population from Jean Monnier, who brought them to the Big Island. And so after three generations, I got an FCC on one, and then I got an award of quality on more than 12 plants of, of better than average quality. Um, and so that also won the 2021 award for the best breeders award. Um, and you'll see the flowers on the top are the female flowers, 
or sorry, the male flowers, the flowers on the bottom are the female flowers, and it was really remarkable to get both of those happening at the same time and into judging at the same time on 12 plus plants. Uh, that was pretty much a miracle. And this one, the best for a thousand last year, and this was one that money won the award more so than growing out of a lot of good plants. Uh, the xanthotic or yellow draculas are very rare and very expensive. I killed this plant three times and kept buying it again. And finally kept it alive long enough to get an FCC. And another Aurea, I don't think quite as nice as the one before, but a pretty spectacularly large plant and a very large plant. Uh, again, the photograph doesn't really show the striata in this, but this should have lines in the petals. And pretty, pretty nice flower counts on the purpurata. Tenebrosa of my lane breeding to, to really try to get the darkness that we've had in very poor shape uh, crossed with uh, the ones that have better shape. And uh, I achieved it in this. And this was an FCC, I got this maybe a month ago on the Breva Pedunculata. Um, Coccinia relative is generally a smaller size and poorer shape, but this one was, was really well held for a Breva Pedunculata. And many thanks to Glenn Barfield. I never would have won any of the national awards without him because they typically turn into a photo contest. Because when the judges across the country are voting, all they're seeing is the photograph, not the plant in front of them. So uh, when they pick the best of the best across the country, the award really goes to Glenn. I'm the one that gets the money, luckily, but I buy him a bottle of wine for each award. Yeah, yes, so we're going to open up for questions. There's a few questions, so go ahead and ask. So Ben, I have a question. At the beginning, you mentioned um, plants that get attacked by botrytis or thrips right before you want to take them into judging. Do you do you isolate them? Do you bring them yeah. in? What are, what are the pros and cons? Do they mature as well if you? Yeah, so Kate's asking about moving a, a plant to try to keep it pristine for judging, and this is a kind of a quandary, because if you leave it on the bench as is, not disorienting the flowers, they're really going to open up their best that way. But many times, if you leave them on that bench, they're going to get botrytis, they're going to get a thrip chewing on them. Um, so if I know my weather's bad, or I've got a thrip outbreak at the moment, I bring them in the house when they're in bud and just let them finish off in the house and then I at least know they're, they're not going to have some sort of pathogen problem. Um, but better off if you can just leave them where they are undisturbed and hope for good weather and no bugs. So, so do they not get as big or as colorful when you bring them in the house? Yeah, so when you bring them inside, the, the light um, of a natural outdoor environment's usually going to intensify color, um, and then you know maybe cooler temperatures at night if they're out in a greenhouse can help get the flowers a little bigger. So they are going to open up to their their maximum if you move them out of the, the nursery situation. But I'm kind of lucky I have a skylight that gives me really bright light in my house, so I don't have to worry about the light so much. It's just the temperature variable. Any other questions? Well, I saw a mail. Let's go to mail. Man, you only got eight plants left here to sell. Can you maybe uh, go over some of them? Uh, what are you intending as far as the breeding? Yeah, I can, I can talk about this in a second. Uh, let me ask, answer Jan's question. You, can you have the lights on? Yeah, so my, my greenhouses are all covered. Um, I basically just call them tarps because I'm just trying to keep the rain off with 200 plus inches of rain a year. So if you're growing in a lath or shade house, there's not much you can do other than try to move them under some awnings or something. Or one way to 
if you're going to be growing outside and you know a plant needs some winter dormancy, is just mount the thing so at least you know it's drying out quickly. Eddie? So I guess we never went to this nursery or went to the big island. Anyway, okay, I have to write down in English. When you are hybridizing both, okay, is there a genetic reason for crossing two cultures or protective species like Agassiz, right? It says, Calabria Suriana, Chunagalia, as human carcaric crossword, single estrellas, as a season, right? This one is the reverse. Is there a reason why they would cross seeds of the first of the same species? Um. Probably the main reason I did it is just to make sure one of them held a pod, and they both held a pod. But they are two different strains. The Cinco Estrella is a very dark flower, and the other population is a really supremely shaped flower with a lot of blooms. Um, so, so it'll it'll kind of be something you and I both will discover. Is you know the. The, well, the mother, the, mother, the mother plant, they say, is like a 60-40. You've got mitochondrial DNA that's going to be coming from that pod parent that you're not going to be getting otherwise. So doing a reciprocal cross should yield different results just based on the influence of which one carries the pod. Mostly from the pod. Also, the tricks of me being good in my pod. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's DNA that only comes from the mother. Um, and in orchids this is particularly valuable and like if you want yellows or oranges in breeding, you're not going to get those generally from the pollen. So if if you want a yellow flower, you need to make sure you're breeding the mother as the yellow. Um, yeah, it's a whole other talk I can give you on genetics, but um, I, I do all this because of genetics and the, the artistry involved in the science, so it's a lot of fun. And so when, you know, all these seedlings I brought in, I basically produce 200 plants out of each seed pod, and I'll keep 40 of them for myself, just so I can bloom them out and see what the differences are, because that's what interests me. I don't want to look at a bench full of clones where 500 plants all look the same. I've got no interest in that. You know, that's, that's death to me as an orchid enthusiast. So I grow everything from seed, so I've got variety. Um, so back to where Mel was, these are, anything I've got in a four inch pot is not available for me. I sell out basically in two inch pots. If you look at my website, you're never gonna see anything but a two inch pot available. Uh, if it's gotten this big, these are my personal plants that I've set aside for myself because I want to bloom them. But I took pity on you guys, and I brought some of my personal stash in. Um, so these are already basically cherry-picked by me as being different from the other 160 plants that were sitting on my bench. So you know, I'm, I'm looking for foliage differences, pigment differences, root differences, bigger all these things and the plants that, that I keep for myself, mainly for my next generation of breeding, I want these kind of superior traits. So, Cattleya bicolor is my absolute favorite species. Um, they're what I call Dr. Seuss plants. They're three to four feet tall, pencil little pseudobulbs with these ugly two or three leaves on top, and then they just produce a massive head of flower, 10, 15 flowers of good size, and the best thing about them is these like brown spotted flowers with the purple lip, when you breed them, they express a rainbow of colors. So if I cross a brown flower with a Cattleya bicolor to like a red standard Cattleya or a yellow Cattleya like that, I get every color of the rainbow out of them. I get pinks, yellows, purples, reds. So Cattleya bicolor was kind of forgotten back in the 80s when People learn these things about breeding with it. And I'm, I'm just redoing what John Lyons from Signal Mountain, Tennessee used to do, uh, reinventing the wheel. So this is Cattleya Bicolor by Alan Kondo. 
Alan Condo is another giant bifoliate but with a nice rich red color. So these should be big bifoliates, a big head of, um, of, of rich purples or red flowers. Um, I'm really into bifoliate cattleyas, as you can probably see. So this mailer is another uh, bicolor hybrid with cattleya guttata, giant plant, big head of flowers. But I crossed it with Cattleya clandii, which is a little kind of squat bifolia. Basically just trying to get more flowers on the compact plant. And they'll be spotted greens and browns. Uh, some people already picked up a few of these. You can probably find some blooming examples. This is a true miniature cat. This is as big as it's going to get. There's a lovely little pink one sitting in front of her. Um, so if you don't have space to grow a three foot tall bicolor or bifolium cattleya, that's a good choice. Uh, the cattleya claim the eye again stays very small, uh, relatively uh, eight inches tall or so. Mariba tiger is one of my favorite things I got from Fred Clark. Um, it is tigrina, which you saw a couple of FCCs crossed with Shilleriana. Another one of my favorite species. These will get about two, two and a half feet tall with really large Schilleriana type flowers. Um, Fred made the cross. I got four out of five that I kept awarded. And this is a uh, sim cross of two of the awarded ones just to, to get even more veterans. And then Ty Rose crossed with Cattleya Bicolor. Any of you may know Leonard Gimes. Uh, a famous old orchid grower from Mahilo. Um, Ty Rose, he named for his daughter, so that was his hybrid. And I crossed that with Cat and Michael. Again, a spotted chocolate with a purple lip. So there are a lot of bifolids, basically, and a couple of them. So that answers no question. Thank you. <laughs> okay, maybe one more question, anyone? Then we're going to go ahead and have refreshments, and then we'll pause a little while and then do a little bit of plant culture. But thank you very much, Ben, for coming yes. and sharing all your information. I, I thought the culture portion of this talk at the end, that was like really, really, really good. So if you can try to remember to do some of those things, that's great. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I would like to say a really big mahalo to Ben Oliveros for allowing me to record him so that I could share this video with all of you and to Milwaukee and Brad Lau for inviting me to the meeting. And I'm sure some of you are wondering if Ben ships and the good news is yes, he does. So I will be including his information in the description box. Mahalo for watching everyone. I hope you all enjoyed today's video and if you did, please don't forget to hit that like button. I look forward to sharing more videos with all of you. And if that's something you think you want to see, please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already done so. Until next time, everyone, remember to always live aloha.